All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, very excited to uh, talk more about um, today, this group of folks over here and what they've accomplished this year and helping to um, kind of shift the culture at SU and try to start having more conversations around open educational practices more broadly, but open pedagogy and open educational resources. So I'm Jessica Clark, I'm assistant provost for faculty success. I'm gonna have the panel introduce themselves. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on how um, this idea came to be, the Open Pedagogy Fellows Workshop. And then we're gonna dive into some questions for the panelists. So I'm gonna let Chuck kick it off. I'm Chuck White. I'm a professor of chemistry here at Salisbury University and I'm the past president of SU. And um, had a, a long career at uh, different universities uh, doing research on high explosives and rocket propellants. Hi everyone, I'm Yuki Okubo in the Department of Psychology. I'm an associate professor. I'm a qualitative researcher and a counseling psychologist by training. Um, I teach clinical counseling courses as well as um, diversity related courses. Good afternoon. My name is Good afternoon. Let's try this again. <laughs> My name is Brandy Nobling. I'm a professor and the program director in the public health program. Um, I primarily teach in the program and my areas of interest and expertise are human sexuality, reproductive health, and chronic and communicable disease. Hi, I'm Jennifer Cox. I teach in the Department of Communication. I'm an associate professor. Uh, my field of expertise is in journalism, multimedia journalism, uh, with in particular news content and social media. Uh, is the focus of my research. And I also wear another hat as the director of our um, Fulton School of Liberal Arts uh, International Internships. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to stand over here. I wanted to stand over here. I, I'm not used to sitting while I'm teaching, so this is really an unusual. I'm gonna try, there we go. It's not awkward at all, is it? Um, so the, the, the idea for this um, project was actually kind of born out of um, where I came into the room. So I came into the room in, in this realm um, for the open pedagogy. I stayed and learned about OER and bought in there. So I kind of did the reverse, I think, of what a lot of folks do. And so in, you know, coming into the amazing work that the Kerwin Center is doing with most, um, and trying to figure out how we could institutionalize and scale up some of the work that faculty are doing around uh, OER and, and OP, how could we scale it up at SU? So we received um, in 2022 the, an institutional grant um, from the Kerwin Center and from most. And one of the things that we proposed was creating a faculty fellows group because what I needed were folks that were doing this really well, that were already very well respected by other faculty, um, and I needed the cheerleaders. And lo and behold, they applied to be fellows. I think I only had to twist an arm or two. Um, and ironically, Yuki, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out on this. Yuki was doing beautiful work in the realm of open pedagogy. She had never called it that. So when she didn't apply, I said, uh, I'm gonna need you to apply for this. You're doing really, really good work in this realm. And she said, oh, I don't know that it's that. It is, it's that. So she'll she'll hopefully tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so that's kind of where this, this started from. And so uh, we'll talk to you a little bit more about how um, the, the workshop was uh, structured, but we ended up having eight fellows and um, out of that, came an eight week workshop for other faculty to join in and learn more. So with that, I have the background, I'll let them do the rest of, of the important details. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the first question. I'm gonna give to Chuck and then open it up for the rest of you. Uh, I'd love to know how you got into this world, where your entrance point was, were there pain points for you or your students? If you can give me a background on why you're passionate about this work and maybe tell the tell the group about what you've created. 
Okay, I'll I'll try. I, I think your your reference to pain points is mm -hmm. right on, and for me, um, there were a couple of pain points that go back to the teaching that I was doing in the mid 1980s, and I'm sure we've all experienced this where. On Monday, I would tell the students, be sure to read chapter four before Wednesday because we want to have a discussion in class on Wednesday. And so we get into class on Wednesday and said, how many people read the chapter? Two hands go up. And so just could not get the students to read. And so out of desperation, I started in the uh, early 90s or mid 90s writing uh, computer computerized quizzes that the students had to take on the reading material before they got to class on Wednesday. And uh, that, that was uh, partly effective. And then I got inspired by a friend of mine um, who would teach very large sections of general chemistry at um, uh, UC Irvine. And uh, every time one of his students got the problem wrong, he would just mark it wrong and give them back uh, to be redone. And I said, well, how many chances did they get? an infinite number if, if they want uh, till the end of the semester. And I said, well, with a large class, the, the work really piles up at the end of the semester, huh? And he said, yes. And so I thought, well, okay, I can probably leverage a computer to, to do some of that work. Um, and so I started writing computerized um, homework graders. And uh, so um, I had already been introduced to uh, open source software uh, and so it was pretty easy to uh, share my things um, publicly, but, you know, I didn't market them and I wasn't uh, interested in starting a company or anything like that. But I did start a company later uh, in the um, early 2000s uh, and just bundled all of these things together and uh, made an LTI connection so that people could use them in learning management systems. And... Um, to, so it just made it easy for people. It's still free, um, but um, uh, it became kind of a consuming hobby uh, for me. So I had a fair amount of experience with OER. And one of the things that I think about in OER is that, yes, it's definitely free in terms of people um, reusing and reusing and mashing up, but it's not necessarily costless. And so, you know, after spending, you know, several thousands of dollars on server costs and things like that, um, I thought, well, you know, at some point I better start recovering these costs in case it gets really big. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're going down that road now. When I think about open pedagogy, I have much less experience. Although back in, uh, I think the late 90s or early 2000s, uh, I came to know David Wiley, who was a professor at Utah State University at that time. He's moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was one of the very early evangelists for OER. And he kept talking about students writing in the open uh, and getting the, the pro student products out of the classroom and to a, a much broader audience. And I understood what he was talking about, but it seemed like just so much work uh, that I just couldn't take it on until 20 years later. And I'm finally doing this now. Uh, this semester, I got involved with the WikiEdu product uh, project, which Jennifer Nyland talked about. Uh, and um, I've had a great experience with my students editing Wikipedia articles uh, because WikiEdu gives them the training that they need and the guidance that they need and I need uh, to do it. And they, so they make it fairly easy to do. And I think it's been great for the students to uh, write for a much larger audience than me, uh, which is all they did in the past. Uh, so um, I'm now a big fan of OP and uh, having fun. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Keith. Um, as Jessica mentioned, um, I didn't really frame my work and what I do as an instructor in that way. And I'm still kind of learning it in the hard way. Like I've never really kind of call it, but I think that, um, you know, for me as an educator, it's important to make everything or a lot of the things accessible, right? And when I think about accessibility, I'm not just talking about students in the classroom being, um, you know, accessing something, but also 
once they actually learn something, when they actually take it out of the classroom, is that knowledge accessible to other people? And so one of the things that I have started doing with students as part of their um, course assignment is to create infographics, right? Now, I actually purposefully don't make them um, be part of the assignment, meaning what I would, the prompt is um, for them to actually write a paper if they were to create infographics. And the students are like, why aren't we making yeah. infographics then? Right? Um, I'm putting actually a little bit of a preventative measures so that they don't just fetch the infographics from somewhere else. Yeah. But I'm actually having them go through the motions of making some decisions about why they're choosing this particular um, targeted audience. Why are they choosing these pieces of information to disseminate and so on and so forth. And then for extra credit, they actually create the infographics. And I actually provide the platform in which they actually present that work. And so that is just kind of one of the few things that I'm starting to do that actually bring sort of accessibility to the next level. So that's kind of what I'm doing. So I kind of followed the same sequence as Chuck in terms of I discovered OER and now through this fellowship, I'm really excited about OP and really excited to incorporate that into the classroom. Um, but it definitely came from an area of need in one of the classes. Um, I teach the chronic and communicable disease class uh, here, and I've been teaching it online for 10 plus years. Um, and about three years into my appointment here, the textbook was no longer being updated. Um, and there really wasn't a good, viable, um, you know, alternative to that. And in something with, with that content, it changes so quickly that, you know, it was becoming dangerously outdated, like the American Cancer Society screening recommendations were outdated and stuff like that. So one of the things I knew when I was looking at what current textbooks were there was I wanted it to be, you know, as up to date as possible. And then when I discovered um, a few years ago, OER, I thought, wow, this could be a great way for me to kind of create a one-stop shop textbook um, resource guide for my students. And so in 2021, I received an individual most grant that gave me a little stipend and then some great professional development for a year and actually how the logistics of putting together an OER textbook works. Um, so I piloted it last fall in 2022 um, after it was peer reviewed and got some student feedback and um, both qualitative and quantitative. And after that first semester, the, it was a pretty significant increase in the number of A's and B's in that class. Um, you know, with this, like I call it one stop shop, uh, class, uh, you know, textbook. And so all of the chapter assignments are embedded at the bottom of each chapter. Um, you know, there's embedded check for understanding quizzes. So it's all right there and they're not having to shuffle among various articles and websites and all of that. So with it being a 200 level public health course, um, it helped reduce costs. So students wouldn't have to buy like, you know, more than one book and also made it streamlined for them. So I'm looking forward to incorporating more OP, but that's kind of where I got started in this. Thanks. Um, I love how diverse all of our experiences with this are because um, my colleagues have produced such impressive uh, OER materials and so many strategies for OP. Um, I'm coming at it from more of an OP, open pedagogy standpoint. And like uh, Yuki, I wasn't even sure that's what I was doing for a little while. Um, I teach journalism and uh, and like I said, social a lot of social media content within that as well. Uh, and so publications are a big part of what I need my students to do. I need them out there producing materials. Uh, but I was really having a hard time getting them to do it. Uh, like Chuck, we I have the same problem of students not completing the readings, and I also had this issue with rubrics, wherein I would give students, you know, I'd have them write an article, and I would literally give them the blueprint for this is how I'm grading you, this is how you need to do this part and this part and this part, and I would have them put check marks on the rubric and turn it in, and I would watch them just sitting in class without their article, just putting check marks on the paper and turning it in, and I was like, 
Okay. And so <laughs> I'd circle, I'd circle it in the grading. They, you know, one, one thing is like one to two sentence paragraphs in journalistic stories and they'd check it. And then they'd give me a five paragraph or five sentence paragraph. And I was like, okay, well, they're clearly not using this. Something's wrong here. Right. Uh, and then, of course, you know, readings, quizzes and things like that are, are were always a bust. And so uh, for me, open pedagogy was really trying to incorporate uh, the students into their own educational experience. So getting them to kind of take the driver's seat in uh, in how they learn. Uh, and so I started with um, I'm sure you've heard the concept of flipped classrooms. Well, I decided to flip the rubric. And so we would uh, learn a concept. And uh, and in the past, I would design the rubric. This is what I'm looking for in your grades. Uh, and so my kind of toe in the door with this type of open pedagogy was saying, well, what if they built the rubric uh, and they decided what's important in these stories and what they should be graded on? And the response was really amazing. So we would have in-class workshops wherein I would just open a document and I'd kind of divide the stories into these parts. And I'd say, okay, what are the, what is the best version of this part of the story look like? And they would basically regurgitate the things in the lectures that they were learning. And they would also then be acutely aware that they were in the rubric because they built them themselves. And so I saw a lot of improvement there uh, and, and the students really enjoyed that. I will say the one challenge, and I think we'll talk about this later, is time. Of course, building these things always takes time uh, away from, from class learning, but it's important. Uh, and the other one I've had a lot of success with, uh, and one of my students is actually here and has benefited from this as well, uh, is open quizzes. So uh, with reading quizzes, of course, they weren't reading. And also, I read differently than they do. So they would always complain about my quiz questions. And I would tell them right off the bat, I'm terrible at writing quiz questions. I hate it. Uh, and so what I have them do now is while they're reading, they write the quiz questions. They submit them the night before, and then I build the quiz based on their questions. And not only did grades go up, obviously, uh, but they were also receiving credit for doing the questions and coming up with good thorough questions. And they've remarked uh, overwhelmingly that they are reading much more closely and digesting the information much better. Uh, and so we've stuck with that uh, policy in my upper level courses. I haven't quite incorporated it into my uh, intro course yet because they need a few more guardrails, but it really has been a great strategy for us. And there's various other things that I that I do as far as having students kind of take the helm on teaching different lessons and materials, uh, particularly when it comes to newer technologies where they are using this these technologies more than I am and in different ways. Uh, I learned about TikTok through my students presenting about TikTok. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's a great way to kind of get them to think about, okay, what are these things that we're using? And then how could we use them if we wanted to as journalists? Um, so those have been some of my strategies. That's great, thank you. Um, so I, I'm gonna ask you, Keen, next about the structure of um, Open Pedagogy Workshop. It was a really fun um, experience working on this with you all because they all came from such different perspectives in terms of what they felt was gonna be really necessary for participants to take away. Um, so I'll let Yuki kind of talk about that process. How I remember this really was very collaborative in nature. So once we came together, you know, it really started out by learning a little bit about each other and what we do and what brought us in. Um, and then really thinking about if we were to, you know, um, get their people's sort of, you know, get them started thinking about OER and OP, like what do we need to actually kind of start talking about? And so we started generating topics in terms of like, okay, like what's necessary, what's important for us to talk about. Um, and then I think we really kind of started generating topics first before thinking about something like logistics, right? Like We all did um, not want to talk about logistics. We had right. a lot of topics. I yeah, I, I think that, in an, I think that's really important though, right? That the, we are not kind of putting the structures and impositions and limitations first. Like we started really talking about, like if we were to 
genuinely kind of start having conversations here at SU about OER and OP, then what do we need to be talking about in terms of the content? So we started there, um, which generated probably more than eight, I think, oh. right? Like, um, but then we had to then start putting things together um, in terms of like, in what ways do we need to talk about it? And we started thinking about the flows and the process and what have you, um, and sort of our own, you know, expertise or what we know or what we wanted to impart with, and then kind of started putting some structures. Um, I think that, you know, certainly some of the definitions, right? Like what is OER, what is OP and what does it look like and what do we need to actually really be thinking about? Um, I think we, I don't know to what extent we were intentional about it, but I think we were definitely thinking about the balance between um, imparting some of the information as well as having discussions and examples with the group, the cohort that was actually coming in and be part of the workshops. And then um, I think we were certainly thinking about emulating, you know, what we we're actually talking about in the content and then doing that also in our workshops themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that was definitely there in terms of like, we're not just going to do a lecture <laughs> kind of workshop, right? Like, so it was going to be um, very interactive and a discussion oriented. And I think in, in some ways, really talking very candidly about some of the challenges and obstacles that we had. That's great. And I'll kind of open that up just as a, as a follow up to whoever wants to answer this. Um, we had, you know, we had a lot of um, diversity amongst the participants and also amongst the fellows. Um, what did, what were your takeaways in your sessions in terms of engagement of the participants and things like that? Did you, it's, it's interesting teaching faculty, right? Or, or engaging in that, in that realm with faculty. Anyone want to? Hello. Okay. I'll say it was uh, interesting having people who wanted to be in the classroom. That was a nice change. Thank you. That's, that's all I needed right. you to say. And it was done. so fun watching. <laughs> no, but it was, it was so great because everybody was approaching it with a different perspective, um, like we did. Um, I think, and, and speaking to you, I think Yuki said it perfectly, kind of how our uh, sessions when it felt like a think tank, uh, where we were kind of all coming in. And I remember distinctly on day one, uh, we were kind of, we talked for about 30 minutes and we went, can somebody define OER for us? <laughs> like we, I, we, we were all doing these things and it applied and obviously knew something, but we were all coming at it from such different angles. Uh, and our, uh, the cohort that we worked with, uh, with workshops did as well. And I think we all brought just such different things to the table and they asked such great questions, uh, that we were able to make our individual approaches, work for the many disciplines that were represented. And I think that was probably the best part for me. Um, I taught about risks and 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 um, challenges. And because, you know, I'm a journalist, so I focus on the negative. And <laughs> uh, but I had so many different questions about things that I hadn't even thought of because I have my own personal challenges uh, and how they can be applied across different disciplines. So I learned a lot in teaching those sessions, too. And I think I actually unintentionally asked my next question, really. Um, and so, Brandy, I was going to let you lead with that. Um, what were the, you know, what what was the vision or goals that you wanted the participants to take away? What surprised you? What, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll echo what Jen said about having an engaged um, group of participants, it's, you know, it's kind of shocking sometimes, especially working with primarily undergraduate students. Um, but, you know, one thing I will say, um, kind of stepping back and, and looking at the, um, you know, the planning that we did, the workshop planning, I just thought it was pretty cool how organically we all fit into a respective title, like content to be covered, even though, you know, we were very, you know, we started with those topics. And, you know, this is what's important, we think, in a however many week workshop or cohort coming in wanting to learn more about OER and OP. But then 
how we just kind of fell into our given <laughs> um, chosen topics, I think was really cool. Um, and I specifically talked about copyright and licensure. Um, and that was a whole new territory for me coming in from, you know, a biology, public health sort of standpoint, you know, um, not really knowing much like legal terminology. Um, and so I kind of approached that one of my goals for this workshop was, you know, approaching the cohort kind of like, you know, I was still, even though I had created an OER textbook, I still feel like I'm still fairly new to this game, so to speak. And so um, just kind of keeping that in mind and really underscoring it, my lessons learned in terms of, you know, what resources are out there. You know, I had to invent the wheel because there wasn't, you know, a, a viable option. So that's why I kind of had to start from the ground up. But there are some great resources out there through like Merlot and through most and some of those other sites where, especially if it's a gen ed um, type of course, there might be material already out there that you can put together. Um, and then just kind of breaking down in as simple as terms I could do what licensure and copyrights all about um, and just kind of gave some tips. But I was, you know, really uh, inspired by how engaged, um, you know, the questions. It was a cohort from various, you know, units across campus. So we had a great, you know, representation there and um, just kind of seeing how each participant planned on using OER. Because most of them, I did like a quick poll everywhere in my, in, you know, my, my uh, workshop, but um, most of them were still fairly new to the game too. They were interested, but they hadn't created anything yet. And so that was insightful too, in terms of like where I wanted to lead them in my workshop. Ryuki, would you like to add anything? Well, I just wanted to uh, echo uh, what the others have said, but um, I think one of the things that impressed me about this experience uh, is that as a group of faculty, we did very little talking past each other and a lot of listening. And I remember a moment um, when uh, Jennifer was talking about flipped rubrics, and I thought, wow, I never thought of that. You know, And uh, so it's something that's easy and well, maybe time consuming, but sounds easy and uh, certainly uh, worth worth trying. And I think this is something that is, uh, it crosses disciplines very easily. And so having a lot of people coming uh, with different lenses and different from different disciplines uh, almost didn't matter uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of ideas were exchanged and not all of them resonated with everybody, but something resonated with everybody. Yeah, that's a great point. Game. Seriously, <laughs> I joke that he's going to be canonized. Um, <laughs> but I think that was an interesting thing for me too, is to see the passion in different people in different areas. Uh, you know, seeing the the incredible commitment Chuck has made, seeing you know Yuki wanting to get a, her students' knowledge out into the community with the workshop that was like it was just really remarkable to see all these pieces and you know having someone say, "Hey, we need to protect the students' work too." That's not something as a STEM-focused faculty I would have con really considered. I mean, you either have a second messenger system that they're going to create, you know, an assignment around, or 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 you don't. It it doesn't they're not bringing in their their own lived experience necessarily in that. So having that be part of the conversation was really valuable for me, seeing that other perspective as well. Yuki, did you want to add anything? Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask Jen the next question. Um, what were some of the thorniest issues and I think I'm I'm coming to you. I knew you'd we, give me that question, yeah. <laughs> maybe perhaps because because I learned a lot. I learned a lot about things that need to be considered and in, in your background in journalism. Yeah, no, thanks. And and it's uh I, I kind of knew this would be my area of focus because uh about I'd say about halfway through uh, our program, I went to Jessica and was like, I'm cons I have concerns. Uh, and and I'm glad we got to explore those. It wasn't just like a cheerleading camp for OER and OP. 
Um, and so when I was tasked with kind of looking at the challenges, uh, that was really, really helpful to me to be able to reckon with those challenges. Um, I have published a textbook myself. I'm writing my second one right now. And so one of my biggest concerns off the bat was, am I a bad person for working through a publisher? <laughs> like, I was very concerned. And so I, I talked to Jessica and, and and that's, and I got a better understanding, you know, that's not what this is about. It's not about, you know, kind of those judgments uh, and things like that. There are certain materials. So in my classes, in our 100 level classes in the Department of Communication, we do use a lot of OER materials. They are a little bit easier to do kind of generically. They also are for larger audiences. They're gen ed classes. Uh, so it creates uh, a great equity for students on campus, which is important. Uh, but then when we get into kind of the higher level journalism, those type of things, the reason I started writing textbooks was like Brandy, there wasn't, I, th th what I needed wasn't out there. Uh, and so, um, I learned, you know, it's okay to to work through one path through this path and to also use some of those materials. But uh, so that was one of the things that I addressed in in my workshop was, you know, that you are giving away your time and your work, and it's something that you have to think about and reckon with. Um, some things that's worthwhile and others not. And there are a lot of things uh, teaching materials that I do give away. Um, I used to use SlideShare all the time and publish a lot of my lectures and they get used in a lot of other uh, settings. And so you just something to think about. Uh, the other thing is obviously when you create a, 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 any type of materials where students are contributing, it does create more work for you and that you have to fact check those materials. They are not the experts. Uh, and so in addition to grading, you are really scrutinizing the materials. Um, so that is a challenge, uh, um, but ultimately one that often is worth it. Uh, it makes them better. It makes you more vigilant. Uh, and as a journalist, I'm all for more vigilance uh, and fact checking in our work. Um, and so those were some of the primary challenges. Uh, also, just the the quality of the materials can vary so widely. Uh, and so that is something where, like I said, we've adopted several in our 100 level classes and gen eds, but I wouldn't adopt ones that I've seen for certain other classes that I have um, because the quality just isn't there. Uh, and so that's something as a professor assigning materials, working with these type of things, you do have to be aware of. And on the whole open pedagogy in general, it's just harder because it's more time consuming and it takes more thought and energy. Ultimately, that's the kind of teacher I strive to be. Uh, I'm, I'm very big on experiential and hands-on learning. Um, I get my students out in the community uh, doing a lot of community and civic journalism. Um, so it's important to me, but it is an added time and, um, and an added stress that you have to take into account when you do these type of things. It's not traditional teaching. Other challenges or thorny points? One of the experiences I had this semester, uh, having my students write edit Wikipedia articles, is you know what what happens when somebody on the outside um, criticizes um, my students' writing or removes it from the platform. And the Wiki Edu people were actually really good about providing advice on how to protect my students' identities and um, how to deal with um, uh, editors uh, who may. Uh, come and trample uh, the students' work. So uh, there are people out there who have a experience yeah. who can help you. That's great. Well, and I mean, we know too, for those that are going into academics, it's good to to learn these, you know, abilities early on to, to navigate the, the criticisms when you're putting things out there. Um, one of the other things I was going, oh, Going back to what Jen was talking about, when we were laying out the weekly topics, at first we we were going to lead with the challenges, and then we thought, or <laughs> we'll wait till the end to cover the challenges. And I think that was a really good approach in in the layout because by the time we got to the end, the participants were in; they were in. So at that point, it was just a matter of polishing, figuring out how, how to deal with those challenges. Uh, associated with, with open pedagogy and OER. 
And I'll say too, I think kind of my big, my overall message in mind toward the end was this is great. Do this, but do it in a way that protects yourself, your time, your work. Think about it. That was kind of my biggest takeaway. It wasn't don't do it. Oh my God, this is scary. But really do it with thoughtfulness. That's great. Thank you. Any chance you have that? So the so we had eight sessions, and uh, we started out. The module two one was intro to open education, module two intro to OER, three um, curricular co design, uh, fourth um, non disposable assignment, fifth um, facilitated guided learning. Sixth, culturally relevant pedagogy. Seventh, open access and creation. And eight, mitigating risk. So those were the topics. So we did kind of build it, right? And um, each of us kind of spoke. And um, I wanted to mention something. So I did a facilitated and guided learning. And as I mentioned before, that, you know, I wasn't really framing my work as an instructor in this way. And when I was actually developing that workshop, I had the biggest um, imposter syndrome of my life <laughs> trying to figure this out because I, I have to tell you all, right, that the, the reasons why I wanted to be part of this was because I wanted to learn, right? I wasn't really thinking that I was doing this work myself, right? Like I wanted to learn more about it so that I can make things accessible to my students and their work to be accessible to public, right? And then I was trying to create this like workshop and I'm like, oh my goodness, like what am I gonna talk about, right? And so I really kind of reckoned with it, but part of my process ended up being this whole thing that we are talking about, which is the co-creating and co-learning <laughs> in the process and really grappling with the notion that you are not going to know everything and that you're going to be vulnerable and try and see what happens as you actually grapple through <laughs> the whole process. And so in the end, I appreciated the process. <laughs> remember I'm a psychologist right so like I do appreciate the process but like going through it I may not right but I think that um the process that I took in trying to figure this workshop out very much became part of what we were talking about for our students and so once I kind of got that you know that made it um a lot easier and also appreciative sort of of this whole co-facilitation or co-learning process that we're trying to create, especially with open pedagogy. Yeah, I think it's a humbling experience for sure. Um, and I, I think the nice part about it is that it brings us back to a place of being a learner, which made it, which makes it fun. You know, we have that opportunity to be the student again. Uh, and that's the whole idea. All right, thank you. So uh, I'd love to open it up uh, to the audience, if there are any questions for the panelists. Jesse. Thanks. Um, Jesse Scheinberg from Stevenson. We have the institutional grant this year, and we're doing a pretty similar thing. Um, so you talked about how the group came organically together and how it was really great and how you guys learned from each other. So just like vibes from the jump or was there like a real, did you, was there intentionality into like building team building stuff or like the way in which you kind of worked together from the beginning? I might have to answer that question. Yeah, you might have to answer that question. Sorry. I, so I, I've got this cool thing. Um, I was very intentional in putting this team together. I, I, the beauty, one of, one of the wonderful things about Salisbury University is that we are a really collaborative, close-knit group. Um, I knew who was doing what, and I knew that this group would work really well together. Um, 
I was also extremely lucky that they applied. <laughs> and then <laughs> that way with a little bit of arm twisting. Sorry. So yeah, it, it was there was some intentionality to it for sure. Fair enough. Yeah, we have we have seven. You know, it's a it's a pretty collaborative and good vibes group, but I wasn't sure if you like did something aside from crossing your fingers and having good people. So the other <laughs> the other piece was the the session that we talked about. I think the, maybe the second session that we got together, um, we had a three hour brainstorming session where we had lunch and we, there was just, there were, there was a lot of whiteboard writing and then there was more whiteboard writing and then we couldn't figure out where we started. And it ended up being a really, really fun, like team building experience. That was not intentional. I wish I could say that it had been. Um, really, it was just, we needed a block of time to really kind of, pull this out but it did it, it was a really fun group to work with you didn't you know you didn't go through the fellows identification process and then the next day hold workshops you know you you did it in kind of a phased way yeah. so that i think you had the time to do step one get a good a new rock star team in place and then step two was the brainstorming and then step three was the actual putting together and leading of the workshop so it wasn't like it had it all jam it all together yeah. um one of the things um i will mention though is even in the weekly order of things we did base it on who was going to need more time so jen went first she did open education she felt really comfortable in that space Chuck went second. He's been doing this since way before it was even cool. Um, you know, and so I think it, it was, it was, and then we had to have challenge mitigating risks at the end. Um, but I think that we were very intentional about making sure folks had enough time to really feel confident in this new space. Because even though we're, we're talking about non-disposable assignments, which we're using in a neurobiology course, that's not what we're normally teaching, right? We're, we're normally most comfortable in our discipline. Um, and so, like Yuki said, there was some imposter syndrome. It's really easy for me to be removed and say, no, but you're doing incredible work. It's so beautiful. How could you possibly feel that way? But it also, I think, again, is a good reminder for how our students feel, right? They have a tremendous amount of imposter syndrome. So it's good for us to have those moments that ground us Right and and remind us what it's like to be on the other side of that. You all could coordinate and only ask questions. I can run around with my lapel pin. Thank you. I'm Mohammed Samar with UMBC. I'm really inspired and touched by the stories that you shared and your journey. Well, OER and OP. So, you know, we have a great group of people here, but um, to be blunt, we would like OER and OP to be more part of the mainstream. So in your opinion, what do we need to change? How can we get it into the mainstream? Do we have to wait another 20 years? Yeah, a great question. But you know what I will say? We're here today, right? We, we have, I wrote this grant in 22, and said, I really hope we can shift the culture. And we're here today, we have this group. So I think we are making progress. And a lot of you came from very far away. So there is a tremendous amount of commitment in this room. So one of the difficulties is that when a student buys a $200 textbook, a third of that goes into marketing for the company. And OER has no budget for marketing. And, and, and so I don't know what the, what the answer to your question is, but marketing is is enormous. And the lack of that ability, I mean, there are organizations like uh, most and, and Merlot and so forth who do some of this, but their budgets aren't any li anything like Pearson's. Yeah, that's a great idea. I will say, um... You know, Salisbury University has been, you know, really accepting of this work as scholarship. And I used, I kind of timed when I was writing this 
for when I went up for full professor. And it was a significant contribution to my scholarship. And I'm just thankful that it was recognized, especially having the data from the students and seeing that connection of the scholarship into the classroom, which is so important at teaching institutions. Um, you know, I, you know, that's that's always been a concern, right? Is where's the scholarship in this? Um, but hopefully that that will be more of an ongoing trend. Yeah, and I think institutional leadership, I mean, it doesn't hurt that the previous president of our university is sitting up here and, you know, was in place as she was getting ready to go up for tenure and promotion. So I think <laughs> I would never imply she told clearly her to totally. But my, my point being is when those environments are supported by upper administration, doesn't doesn't hurt. Sure. Okay, I guess I'll just, um, one of the things I'm thinking about, because your last session, you mentioned folks had students there, and they were talking about um, the money that t it takes, the time and the labor to do these things, and publications and internships, that maybe the next step to keep this going is to now get the students on board with helping to create these things. And that could be something to add to their resume when they go to graduate school or get jobs that I created this learning material and I did something wonderful with it. Absolutely. Excuse me. I think the the reasons why, um, you know, I mentioned about infographics earlier, right? Um, the student buy-ins is very important, but I think one of the reasons why it's important to get their buy-in is because they're coming here to get education. And a lot of times they're not seeing the utility of it in the outside world, <laughs> right? And, and so when they're actually learning something, if we can actually figure out a way for the applications of what they're learning, um, and they can actually use what they're learning to whether educate their loved ones or people they know, or that they can figure out a way to, you know, share the information, or they can actually say, well, this is what I'm learning, and it's actually pretty cool, right? Um, and really also um, creating a platform so that they can share that and also put it in their resume or CV, right? So like part of it is really kind of putting those things structurally so that they can easily do this and then realize that, oh, okay, I didn't think that the course that I was taking is going to go anything beyond this, you know, course that they just enrolled for a semester and it goes on their transcript. No, it can actually be a lot more than that. And so I think that, especially in the age of like them using to TikToks and info, you know, um, Instagram to actually get a lot of the news and information and knowledge. Um, if they can figure out a way to translate what they're learning, I think that would be really helpful and exciting for them too. Um, back here, I'm Jeff Dean. I'm a graduate student and here at Salisbury University. I study rhetoric and composition. Uh, I am a teaching assistant in for our first year writing course here, and I sit on a committee that was tasked with basically asserting some of the um, curricular aspects of our first year writing program, and we were trying to figure out how to do that, and we all kind of realized that everybody on the committee was a rhetorician or a compositionist in some way, and maybe we should use those skills to assert the the skills that we were trying to assert. And um, so I'm struck with the same kind of realization right here, which is if OER is this powerful, I had never heard of it before I came here today. So this is very fascinating to me. So I don't know if OER or OP are the right terms, but it feels to me if it's this powerful, and as Dr. White said, we have a need to market it. How does OER market, how, how is OER used to market OER? Sounds like a great senior capstone project. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, there's some. Oh. Thank you for the hand pointing. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Fields, also from Stevenson University. So I, I wanted to ask if you could tell us a little bit about how the workshop series was received by faculty. Did you get good attendance or did you do a, a formal evaluation of its effectiveness? Semi-formal. Yeah, so we had very good attendance. Um, the, the fellows that, or the participants um, are actually gonna be called to see if they would like to be fellows this coming year. Um, so there, there was a focus group and then this person could come and that person could come and then this part, because it all happened at the same time as inauguration. Um, so I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be revisiting that actually in January um, to have that conversation. But in terms of the in-class or in-workshop experience, I was, like we were saying before, amazed by the engagement and, and the, and the cross-engagement too. Oh, that's interesting. You do that in social science. I could never pull that off. Well, have you thought about doing it this way? Uh, so there were, and I'll let you all speak to that. <laughs> Maybe I said it already. They were very interactive. Um, and I think also took some risks um, in sharing sort of their experiences and being, you know, not only just sharing sort of what has worked, but what hasn't worked and being open about that and to have discussions. And so as we were kind of, you know, jokingly saying, like they were very enthusiastic in learning and also, you know, communicating. And I think another reason why it worked is not only were we diverse, um, as fellows, but um, the participants also were diverse in terms of their disciplines and expertise as well. And I think that, um, you know, some of them I knew from before, but um, some I met them then and there and since then have been collaborating, which is really great. And so I think just overall, like having that shared space was extremely helpful. One of the, one of the things that I noticed in one of the, I don't remember which workshop it was, but one of the participants brought his son because his son was home for the day. And I thought, wow, that's that's a commitment. I don't, I wanna say I'd bring my seven-year-old, but I don't know that I would. Um, but so that, that was an example of it. One of the other things that really stuck out to me was in, again, in one of, I don't remember which one it was, but one of the participants, I think it was co-curricular design. One of the participants said, when I was in college, I had a faculty member ask me to co-create something with him. And then he went on to, you could watch him walk through this and go, oh, that's why I ended up in academics. It was just this really funny, because he, he said I had never been asked by anyone before for my knowledge. And, and it was just this really funny moment, like you could see it happening. So yeah, it was it was it was some moments like that that I think were really fantastic. That's a really good segue to my question. Um, that have you seen any of these kind of light bulb moments from students that they're like recognizing that like they are participating in the learning process and seeing them that they're understanding their own learning better. that experience to some extent uh, when I have students uh, present on topics that we haven't discussed in class where they are the ones doing preparing the lecture in the traditional way that I would uh, where they will come in with that kind of imposter syndrome they don't know what they know and they'll come in and I'll you know give them some guidelines but also say be creative and be interesting what if you if I were teaching it how would you want me to do it uh, and I've had students come in and I can see them as they present, they're kind of nervous and then they start to make connections. They're like, so I'll, I'll use the TikTok example again. They know how to use TikTok. Well, they know how to scroll through it anyway. Uh, and then I was like, okay, now TikTok as a journalist, how can we use it? And they had to kind of do the work. And then they, part of their project was they had to do a TikTok as a journalist. And then they were the experts and through the process, they became the experts. And I told them, I was like, you know more about this than I do. Uh, now let's put our worlds together. I know journalism, you know, TikTok, let's put them together and you teach me something. And you could kind of see 
as they're presenting, even the confidence build, uh, you know, I know this, you can do this. And you see the students respond to other students uh, better in that way too. So I see that a lot where students will kind of come at it at the beginning and go, well, I can't lead a class. I'm like, yes, you can, you know this stuff. And more to the point, you're gonna do the work like I do when I prepare a lecture and you're gonna present it and be the expert. And and I, I think that they definitely retain and process that, process that information at, at much higher levels when they do that. I had an experience in a class just recently where we were talking about combustion of coal and the relationship between that and air pollution. And in the middle of this discussion, this light went on in one of my students because she had been working on a Wikipedia article uh, related to this subject. And suddenly she said, oh yeah, I know all about that. And for the next five minutes, she was leading the class instead of me. And I thought that was a great moment. I, I had all of the students um, actually just this past week um, give a short presentation on uh, the article that they edited and the changes that they made. And I think that made them aware that they were an expert uh, in this very small area. And I think that's a, a, an important revelation for them. I can also add um, that recently, so I'm writing um, letters of rec for some of the recent graduates, and one of them came back to me asking for a letter, and she had taken my counseling skills class. And um, she was mentioning about learning to um, not only use counseling skills, but using it as a way to facilitate discussions. And she essentially said, I use the skills that I learned from the class every single day at my work now. And that is so helpful for me that, um, you know, had I not taken this class, right? That's not something that I would have taken away from my undergraduate education. And so that was really made my day. We do have um, one, I think this is probably our last question from the chat. Um, so Manisha Karatapal is asking, do you get questioned from students that this is the job of the instructor to be the expert? No. <laughs> I mean, that would be, that would be, I'd be surprised. They may think it, they may put it in my student evaluations. <laughs> well, Melissa, do you? Well, I was going to say, though, follow up to that question, when part of your process, are you explaining to the students hmm. the purpose of what they're doing yeah. or how they're doing yep. it? So just for online people, the question, the Follow-up question was, are you explaining to your students what you're like, why you're doing what you're doing and how it's how it may be different? Yes, and the answer is resounding yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> the transparency is an important part when you're looking at structure, dynamics of those roles. I think it's important to be really transparent about why you're doing everything in the flipped rubric, the great example. I think that you need to get a buy-in from students, especially when you're doing, whether it's, you know, non-disposable assignments or you're trying out an uh, exercise. If they're not into it, they're not going to get into it, right? So I think that, you know, there's only so much of, like, trust the process. Like, you know, I know that this works, that students are going to be okay with. And so there is a lot of explaining and there is a lot of unlearning. There is a lot of unlearning for us and trying things out. And there is also a learning of if something doesn't work, doesn't mean that we didn't learn anything either. So like all of those things, I think has to be explained and probably multiple times. questions together as well as far as do we get challenged uh, as being the experts and things like that. Um, for me, I, I tell my students on day one, I became a journalist because I'm a lifelong learner. I love become, getting to go out and talk to people and be a mini expert in different topics every single day. So I structure my classes the very same way. They know that a classroom 
of mine is going to be reciprocal learning. I am open to what you have to say. You tell me, you, know, you listen to what I say. I'm going to respect what you have to say uh, as well. And particularly because, again, I teach social media where they are very adept at using it, but they don't necessarily know how to use it in the right ways that I need them to. Um, so I emphasize that reciprocal learning throughout the semester. And I think that that really helps establish that trust from the get-go with this type of thing. All right, folks, thank you so much. Thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Nancy.